Good afternoon. My name is Nora Balgoin with ITC. At ITC, I am an area manager of local government community affairs. Uh, in attendance today are many of our region's elected officials, civil servants, utility leaders, and primary employers. Thank you for joining us today for a conversation around broadband. We at ITC know the importance of solid infrastructure in order to keep ours a community of choice for this and future generations. ITC's commitment to provide reliable power to our region's employers makes this discussion one we feel is urgent to keep our community competitive and positioned for moving forward with advancing technology. As advocates for our stakeholders in our region, ITC is pleased to sponsor this event which is, which is intended to educate and bring awareness to this important opportunity. It's my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Jennifer Owens. Jennifer serves as the president of Lakeshore Advantage, leading the economic development team. As part of their efforts, they have identified broadband as an opportunity area to focus on to remain a community of choice for business growth and talent retention and attraction. Jennifer will present an overview on the why behind this conversation and moderate a discussion with our panel of experts. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Nora, and thank you, ITC, so much for sponsoring today's webinar and really being an extended member of our team. We couldn't do our work without partners like ITC Holdings and others. And so today is really a chance to um, have an educational session on understanding broadband at a high level. It is a very complex topic, but I, we've got some great speakers here today that I'll introduce you to who can really boil it down in a way that makes sense so you all understand why broadband is so important for our region's overall economic vitality. So life is different, right? Life has shifted during this worldwide health crisis. And now we see there's a light at the end of the tunnel um, there's a light at the end of our day staring at a screen and only having virtual options to connect with people. And that is good, but the virtual options have, are still here to stay. And this pandemic really accelerated our acceptance of engaging digitally with doctors, with our customers and our teachers, just to name a few. And it really challenged us all in the way we work and how we can work most efficiently. It brought us closer to our families. Sometimes it brought us farther away from our families for those of us who spent a little bit too much time cooped up. Um, and you know, our new normal is gonna be great in a good way. It is going to be new and it's gonna be different. But without access to high-speed internet or broadband, businesses in our region and residents simply don't have the tools they need to be successful. So without broadband access, virtual learning and work is frustrating and it can almost be impossible. And that need is only going to continue. According to our most recent business intelligence data, the vast majority of business leaders say their company's needs for internet access and speed are increasing. And I would say the same thing for our residents as well. So access to broadband has a big potential to be a huge economic engine for those communities and regions that invest in it. According to some recent studies by Connected Nation, those benefits include an average household income increase of more than $1,800 for an increase in broadband, and it is estimated a 1% increase in broadband access could create or retain about 1,200 jobs statewide. So I'm all about jobs and investment in growing our community. So before we get started with our panelists, we wanted to access your knowledge on this topic. So on the screen, you'll see a poll that asks you to self-assess your level of broadband knowledge. Now, be honest, don't worry, no one's gonna look at your collective answers. And I know for me, I'm certainly not a PhD, probably close to an amateur on this topic. So we're gonna take about 30 seconds, we're gonna ask you to vote, and that's really gonna help our panelists gauge their conversation today.
All right, the bowls closed. Let's see. Okay, so we've got a pretty good mix here. We got a lot of amateurs like me. Um, no one's a PhD, although I think our panelists probably qualify as PhDs. Um, but that's great. We're across, across the way in terms of our expert. So about, you know, a big chunk of you say you're an amateur and we're going to make sure that this content today really makes a difference for amateurs and for experts. So what does our community say overall? How do they feel about Broadman? So we sent our team to the streets and I'm going to play a quick video so you can see what our community is thinking as it relates to Broadman. Go ahead, play the video. Hello, I'm Emily Staley with Lakeshore Advantage, and today we are in downtown Holland asking people, what is broadband? Internet connection? The, the internets are brought to your home and businesses. I know it has something to do with the internet. Uh, internet access. Just the internet spread around uh, for everyone. The range of areas can reach uh, many people. Um, in general, uh, I know it's getting better. I've heard it was pretty fast. Well, depends on your service. I assume it's relatively fast. It could be as fast as you need it to be. Well, I couldn't work because I work remotely. To get a connection. I look up information, I research things. It allows me to work at home. We get a lot of directions from the internet. No question, I'd get lost all the time. I use it on my computer, internet. It's almost essential to have broadband. So as you can see, broadband means something different to everybody and is defined a little bit differently by everybody, but we all count on it. Great, thank you to the people on the street. Um, obviously, broadband is different to each person, but I bet you each one of them would say it was important, including the little boy who I'm sure loves to play on tablets. So the FCC defines broadband as um, transmission of bandwidth data over a high speed internet connection. And currently that definition is 25 megabits per second and an upload speed of three megabits per second. So this definition was set in 2015. Now that was before Disney Plus, before YouTube TV and HBO Max and on and on and on. So generally speaking, if a household has four devices and the devices are using three basic internet applications, that household requires high-speed broadband to run your task successfully. So in my house, we probably have 15 devices going at once. So most of us need it, but not all of us have it. And there are all kinds of solutions to solve that digital divide from fiber to fixed wireless to satellite. There's so many options for communities. And so to guide us through this conversation today, we have some fabulous panelists that I'm going to introduce. Our first panelist is Jeff Dorr. Jeff is the Director of Customer and Business Solutions at ITC Holdings. Jeff targets economic growth opportunities, and he and his team engage with ITC's largest partners and stakeholders. Welcome, Jeff. And our next panelist is Charlotte Beaversdorf. Charlotte is the Vice President of Community Engagement with Merit Network. Merit's network is to connect organizations and build communities through their fiber infrastructure. And Merit has actually just been selected to work with Ottawa County as they tackle the digital divide. Welcome, Charlotte. And our final panelist today is Dave Coster. Dave is the general manager for the Holland Board of Public Works, and he is a key leader on the Holland Fiber Initiative. Dave is an advocate for continuous improvement, and with him and his team, he brings a wealth of information, Holland's pilot program, and invigorating broadband. Welcome, Dave. So we see all of our panelists here on the screen. And what I'm going to do is each one of them, I'm gonna ask them some questions and we'll kind of engage in a conversation about broadband. So the first one, I'm gonna go with Charlotte. So Charlotte, when a community looks at extending access to broadband, what do you say is their first step to get down the road? 
probably pick the hardest question for first because the answer is it depends on the community and kind of where they're at. Um, so when we really look at um, this question, I think I, I would come back and say, looking at broadband expansion is different than being ready for action with broadband expansion. Um, and this entire very complex and complicated thing, uh, the journey to broadband, as, as Jennifer mentioned, is really a journey. So the first thing that we typically do when talking with counties or local units of government that are looking at this is get an assessment of readiness. And that's typically just happens through a discussion around where the community is at with local buy-in, with prioritizing broadband, um, you know, things like that. If a community needs support in getting organized and prioritizing broadband and creating stakeholder groups and the political will uh, to prioritize the, this as an initiative, um, communities can leverage the broadband jumpstart program, um, which we offer through our moonshot program. Um, and I'll talk, you know, more about moonshot throughout today, but that's our statewide initiative to address the digital divide at Merit. And so jumpstart's a really good way um, through the broadband alliance um, to get started and get organized. Uh, then uh, communities, once organized with committed stakeholders, the next step is really getting shovel ready. And I'm sure folks are starting to hear this shovel ready concept all over the place because we're seeing a really active federal funding market right now. And the vendor community that provides services around all of this are really um, getting active with local communities uh, to try to sell their services and, and the whole mantra is get shovel ready and and we do believe that you know now is the time to get shovel ready so to do that um, we've created this program called the moonshot pathfinder program and that's all focused around early planning activities such as data collection to get a, a granular and unbiased assessment of where broadband is and where it is not within the community and who's adopting it how the community feels around broadband and broadband expansion. So that's data collection and it's a very, very valuable step uh, in, in community engagement early in the process that we support uh, with multiple counties as Jennifer had mentioned. Next come feasibility and pre-engineering and that's kind of getting down to the nuts and bolts of where infrastructure needs to be deployed. What are the costs around that? Um, those activities help support, along with data collection, um, all the information a community needs to really inform uh, difficult steps around how we're going to fund the network, uh, what is the operating model of the network, and et cetera. Um, so you begin to move from the planning stages of the, the broadband journey into the build and run uh, kind of section of the journey. So again, uh, data collection is a really good way to start that. It's pretty light lift and we've got a turnkey program to support that. We've also recently launched the Moonshot Community Grant Program to help support these early planning activity expenses for communities um, because we really believe that, you know, uh, the, the timeline is short to take up the opportunity for all this federal funding that's coming. And you have to get these activities ready to really produce um, competitive grant responses. So Charlotte, that grant program, that is all on your website, information on those programs and the moonshot, so. Yeah, it's merit.edu forward slash moonshot. Cool, good, that's super helpful. And I know that I've been part of the Ottawa County um, Digital Inclusion Survey and Merit just blew us away in the RFP process. So we're really looking forward to working with you and hopefully more community leaders can take advantage of your expertise. So thank you. Now I'm going to switch gears to Dave. Um, Dave, you know, we love private sector solutions. We love, you know, can't, why can't the private sector take care of this? Why, you know, why are internet service providers just not coming in um, and providing this access to all the customers in the area? Can you help us understand the challenge with that? Yeah, you know, I think it's a combination of factors, really. And, and one, it's important to understand that, you know, developing and deploying a broadband network is a very highly capital intensive endeavor. And as you mentioned, it, you know, right now, the incumbents are, for the most part, um, for profit entities. And so there's this competition for capital, and the use of that in deploying it. And so you know, they want to see a pretty quick return on that investment. And then naturally, that's going to happen in the more dense areas, you know, where people are at, and they can have more subscribers, more density means more cost effective deployment. And so what you see is that being kind of the focus and what ends up being left behind then often are areas where they're less dense or smaller communities. And then that creates this divide, you know, that happens. And it's really sort of a natural out 
outcome of this process of, of a for-profit entity with a capital deployment that is, is, is limited. You know, this is not unusual when you look back in time and you think about electricity, you know, in the BPW, obviously been in electricity since the late 1800s. It was born out of the fact that municipalities needed to take control of their own destiny because the larger um, uh, private electric companies focused on big urban areas first. And so you saw municipalities come up and, and, and come into being. You saw uh, member owned rural electric cooperatives come up and fill some of that void. And, and it may be that in terms of a solution, and I think what Holland is looking at as well, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, is that that's another opportunity here for jurisdictions to maybe fill in that role of creating and um, improving that infrastructure to uh, control their own destiny just on broadband, like it happened on electricity years ago. It's the infrastructure of the future. So, um, and you know, it's, it's maybe private, public, nonprofits all working together, but we've got to figure out a way to get it done. So. I think we'll find that there are some, you know, important pieces of that. There are multiple layers involved. And I think when you have uh, the infrastructure, that core piece, there is an opportunity there, I think, for the public sector to be involved in that. Right. So Jeff, you're, you know, you're the private sector guy here and ITC, great partner overhead transmissions line is primarily what we think about when we think about ITC. Um, but share with us how ITC uses fiber and, and your interest in being part of this discussion. Sure, Jennifer. And maybe before I jump in to how we use it, maybe a little bit about what electric transmission, the electric transmission system is. And we all have smartphones. Some of us have smart refrigerators and smart washer and dryers. Well, now we have a smart grid. And um, ITC owns and operates electric transmission systems in eight states. We have the tall towers like the ones you can see behind me. And uh, we have 16,000 circuit miles of transmission, uh, which if you think about it, if you were driving from New York to California, you'd have to go back and forth six times just to kind of put that in perspective. It's kind of like we're the freeway system, if you will, uh, the super highway for the electrons. We're moving those electrons from the generation source to the substations, which is where we serve load customers. Um, ultimately, we don't serve load customers, our, our partner utilities do, and uh, those substations are feeding your homes and businesses in your area. So our, our connections are primarily to utilities, uh, power plants, large manufacturers like GM, Ford, and Chrysler. And our number one goal, as you can imagine, is reliability. So we want to have a good, robust transmission system. So back to your question in terms of how does fiber optics coming into play with the transmission system. We've all come home and we've seen our microwave oven clock blinking. Nobody likes that. You got to figure out how to reset that thing again. It's no fun, right? Or maybe we've seen our lights blink on and off. That's, that is the grid working. Um, you know, so what happens is in a storm, if a branch falls onto a, a distribution line, a lot of times the switch will open and close three times before it'll stay open. That's a good thing for us at home because we don't have the sustained outages. The businesses on the other hand, you know, they measure outages in terms of cycles. A cycle is um, measured at one sixtieth of a second. Businesses don't want to see outages more than, 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 you know, six cycles. So six sixtieth of a second is kind of what we're operating to. What the fiber allows ITC to do is, uh, and we call it, um, o OPGW or optical ground wire. And our, our uh, fiber optics are located in this uh, wonderful illustration behind me, those very top wires. And, we, and they also serve as shield wire. So uh, when lightning strikes, uh, it, it uh, helps get that lightning to the ground and protect our assets, but it's also where our fiber is located. It's tough to get to. Uh, you know, so it's, it's tough for people to access it from a security standpoint. Uh, but what we're using it for is really to connect our control rooms to our generators and our substations, again, that feed the businesses and homes. Uh, it detects lightning strikes. It gives us alarms when there's problems on the system. It helps us control our assets and re, uh, redirect the, the flow of electrons. And you know, with our changing energy environment, it's more important than ever that we're utilizing the most advanced technologies. You think about 
the energy policies going from carbon neutral uh, where they, you know, to renewables like wind and solar, those are intermittent resources. So, you know, we're gonna have to be able to quickly shift that power around and, and make sure that the, the, uh, the system is running and when you go to turn your lights on that they're gonna work. You think about even um, the, you know, what's happening you know, with uh, the, the shift to electric vehicles. It's another uh, shift in, uh, in things that we're thinking about out in the future. Uh, they just uh, announced the Ford F-150 is in production. I think they ordered something like 48,000 pre-orders in, in 48 hours. Uh, it's just amazing how fast it's coming on. So all things that we're thinking about and uh, what, what the uh, fiber system uh, is going to do for ITC is allow, allow us to enable protection, operate switches and breakers, direct the flows where they need to uh, be directed. It's going to offer the physical security so we can see the system electronically and we can remotely operate these assets. And, and so that in a nutshell is really what it does for us as a transmission company. Is that same fiber able to transmit data from residents or, or is it not, you know, not a similar? Yeah, it's a good question, Jennifer. And, and right now it's a closed loop system. It's a, it's a very highly secured system. Uh, you know, so um, we, we take, again, our, our priority as a transmission operator is reliability. And we really hang our hat on that notion. Um, and in fact, you know, speaking from an economic development, uh, you know, scope, um, you know, we, we've got an excellent record uh, where we own and operate transmission. Uh, we're, we're always the top um, uh, provider when we do benchmarks uh, in terms of reliability. Uh, right now, though, uh, the, the system is a, a closed system, um, and it's something that we had been looking at is, uh, you know, could we make our spare fiber, it's called dark fiber in the industry. That's something I learned. I was like the kid in the video, and, I, you know, that was my face when they first asked me to get involved in this. So admittedly, I was kind of an amateur. I kind of worked my way up to maybe knowing a little bit, maybe not as much as my kids, but I'm getting there. And uh, dark fiber is a new term for me, but that's basically fiber that we're not using. So there was an, there's an internal debate that's been going on in our company on, you know, can we offer dark fiber up to outside of our core business transmission? You know, so, um, and, and I think we're going to get to that a little later. I don't want to uh, give you all the thunder here. No, that's cool. I love it. I love that a little teaser there. Um, so I can't wait to dive into that a little bit more, but I'm going to go to Char go back to Charlotte again. Okay. So Charlotte, there's all this um, federal state money coming down um, for trying to solve fiber access to broadband. Um, why have we not made more progress on extending access um, to our communities? Well, I, I think the reason to date we haven't made made enough progress is that I think we're just now actually seeing the investment levels that are in when, you know, within the realm of what it's going to take in order to reach ubiquitous connectivity in the country. Um, you know, some estimates just for the state of Michigan are in the neighborhood of two to three billion to achieve broadband for all, uh, to kind of put that into scope. So it's really, um, encouraging that we're starting to see the B in funding. I think that's a, a really good indicator that, you know, first we have to fund the last mile infrastructure. So that's important. Um, you know, I mentioned last mile because previous big federal investments have been primarily around building out middle mile networks. And um, that's very important because that is kind of the super highway of last mile connections, which are what communities kind of connect through um, to uh, those larger highways and then out to the greater world. Um, this funding is is primarily being focused on last mile connections, which is important. So um, I think, you know, that's another good indicator. This funding is, um, you know, my third point, it's being directed at local, regional and state government, uh, which we, we saw, you know, last week with the NTIA's notice of funding. Um, and, and with recent treasury guidance that um, included language that will push past some of the restrictive state laws. Um, you know, some, some laws uh, in, are, are in states and they actually prohibit broadband funding from being awarded to municipal entities or education. Michigan is one of those. Um, so we saw the federal guidance um, from the treasury uh, last month or, or maybe it was early May. And there was language in there that will um, navigate that so that uh, local units of government and, uh, you know, not only state governments can receive this funding. And so I think that's positive for progress um, 
uh, in Michigan. Um, I think, oh, go you ahead. want me to keep going or do you have to cut no, me go off? go ahead, please. Okay. I was just gonna, one last point, um, you know, I think that in some cases um, with some of the past state and federal funding, just kind of look, looking in the rear view, I've noticed that there's been a little bit of a disconnect from local efforts. Uh, sometimes we see ISPs go for, for large federal wins and there isn't a requirement to do a lot of engagement at the local level. So locales may have already been engaging with private sector or even pursuing maybe a muni owned network. Um, and then a large uh, chunk of, of federal funding gets dropped right in the middle of that business model. Um, and so that, that might disrupt um, things that are already in play locally. And so I think there needs to be a lot more tie-in uh, kind of up and down the stack. As Dave mentioned, this is really a layered and complex issue. And we've got to really build this ecosystem that, that creates um, congruency between all the layers, local, state, federal, um, et cetera. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I think it's kind of interesting as you look at the data, um, some of the readily available data, it looks like access is probably a lot higher than it is. And which is, you know, kind of part of the reason I think Ottawa County is doing this resident survey, um, because the anecdotal evidence shows, um, especially from our school districts and others, there are a lot of people who can't get any access or very limited access at home. Um, so if we know we have those dead spots, which I know we do, what does that mean for our community's future growth? Um, you know, I think uh, it, it means that we have to be honest that there is still a digital divide out there. And that's, you know, the first question you asked me, Jennifer, was, um, you know, about what can communities do as a first step? And I think the, the pandemic gave us, um, it really flattened the learning curve of what the digital divide is, what that impact is to communities and individual citizens. Um, and for folks that are driven off of the, the federal maps, um, you know, to stand behind the fact that there is not a divide when in fact you can walk down the roads and see that one side of the street has access and the other still does not, um, that we have really come to a point where um, everyone knows the reality is that communities aren't uh, fully served or if they're served, it may be with subpar capacities to meet the needs of today's digital economy. So the first thing is admitting the problem. Um, and then the second thing is really getting organized around just taking tangible steps toward progress. And, and I'll just point that back to get involved in the early planning activities um, to, to begin the process. I like that, that's great. And you know we have a utility in the Holland Board of Public Works that made an investment quite some time ago in, in fiber and is somewhat a ways a trendsetter in providing direct um, broadband access um, and kind of been testing this pilot for quite some time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it over to Dave and say, Dave, you know, how is Holland working to provide broadband access to everyone in the community? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, for those that are, are, are viewing from home, they might not know that we've been in the, the broadband business for really a, a few decades now. Um, and we've done, as Jeff talked about, dark fiber lease arrangements where private companies will you know, put their own equipment on those X spare fibers that we had. We originally built our fiber network to support our own utility operations. Um, we've also had uh, provided direct connection between municipal buildings, between libraries, healthcare uh, environment in our community. So it's been very successful for us in Holland. But, you know, as Charlotte talked about this last mile for all the citizens and, and residents of Holland, you know, we don't have fiber deployed everywhere in Holland yet. And it's really the vision of our city council and our board of public works that we have a ubiquitous system in the city of Holland and really appreciate their leadership on that. You know, what we, we really kind of start with this idea of thinking about um, our vision about these layers of the infrastructure versus the actual services or content, you know, that is going across broadband and sort of separating those two things. And this illustration on the, the slide that's up here really gets at that here. You see these two carriers that are bringing products, right, to, to um, you know, potentially to your doorstop. You know, you maybe you got something delivered through FedEx or UPS. You have choices, but what you don't see is you don't see that both FedEx and UPS, like on the right-hand side, would actually create their own road, right? I mean, that doesn't happen. Uh, or maybe it's Amazon today, a third road gets built. You know, if you could imagine 
that if everybody had to build their own road to provide something across it, you know, you would have places that never would have roads built to them because people wouldn't demand enough services to justify it. Uh, you wouldn't have, uh, you know, offering choices. You might have one company, you know, that actually can drive and bring you something down that road. You know, our vision is that just like these roads, broadband is an infrastructure that can be an open access model that can bring a lot of different services across it. So if you move on to the next, next slide here, kind of illustrating this a little bit further, is that this base infrastructure kind of like the roads, and, and we see that as being the fiber optic or you know, wireless or whatever it might be, an infrastructure to actually bring the content of different providers to the, um, the end user. So what we're trying to do here in Holland is look at some models that would allow us to build the infrastructure as a community for the community to be able to make an investment in the long term to be able to enable a number of different service providers. So the common infrastructure being that lowest tier being a public investment. And then on top of that, then when you look at the service providers, you see a number of different entities there. The Holland BPW on the far right could possibly do it. You know, we have incumbent providers of services in our areas that could utilize a network like Comcast or AT&T, our partner ISPs that we use today, like 123.net and iServe. The healthcare system itself being a provider of services in Holland Public Schools, utilizing that, that, that infrastructure to reach their constituencies. That's, that's an open access model. And then if we think about what's evolved today, instead of having to have this vertical integration of utility provider of the infrastructure be the same one that's providing the content. We know that today when people have access to high speed connectivity, there's a whole plethora of available over the top services that they could subscribe to based upon their desires. You know, everywhere from Hulu to Netflix, YouTube TV, UMA for phone service, all these things are available. So what we're working on in Holland is really that conversation with our community. It's a stakeholder driven, big, big discussion for our community to decide, is it important enough that a community investment is made so that we can recover the infrastructure over a longer period of time, have this patient capital instead of the you know, quick return on investment that maybe has been needed, which has driven these pockets of where investment exists and where it doesn't exist. And with that patient capital and that longer term recovery, lower the cost burden for everybody and actually not create a system where there's few choices, but create a system where there's multiple choices to help bring a lot of different services to people. So that's the vision that we're working on in Holland and it involves a very intense community discussion and ultimately a decision from a community funding model that, and we're working towards that right now to bring to our community the discussion and ultimately a decision to make as too far as their willingness. We think that this is actually a model that is replicable as well, that other communities could, could pursue this sort of thing. And, and if this gets put in place, then you could have this network of communities that have maybe even common operation to help lower costs even further for people. So um, it, we're excited about it. And, uh, but we see this really as a necessary step to break down this divide that exists between where the served areas and underserved areas here in Holland. So um, more to come, but this is, we're right in the middle of this important discussion here in our community. That's great. And you know, it, and we actually had a great question from a, a healthcare leader about really making this be um, the vital infrastructure of the future. And, you know, it sounds to me like it's gotta be public private partnerships and there has to be ability um, from the residents to in some way pay for that infrastructure as they do with water and electrical electric services, you know, you've got to pay for that backbone as well. Well, you um, can be assured that they're going to pay for it regardless, one, one way, or, way the or the other, other. right? And yeah. the issue is, you know, can they pay for it under a not-for-profit extended period of time so that then they can offer choices across it, or are they going to pay for it under more of a for-profit situation? And I'm just talking about that core lowest layer there. And that I think is the epitome of this public-private partnership where you see everything that's above that line has private opportunity within it. It's just a matter of using the core infrastructure as a public piece 
to ensure that a long-term investment on the, on the part of the community can be made and that community can have self-determination on whether they feel 25 and three, you know, 25 download, three upload is sufficient or whether they believe something even much greater for their community is needed in terms of bandwidth capability. Once that decision is made, then a lot of private opportunities can come in on top of it to serve the content needs. Great. And you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it on to Charlotte because Dave provided a great example of Penelope PW and public private partnerships. Um, Charlotte, can you provide any other examples of what those partnerships have looked like in other communities that have helped kind of solve some of the digital divide? Yeah, and I, I brought examples, but I'm really excited about what Dave's saying. I, I want to kind of capstone that. I, I think, um, you know, when I think about um, the digital divide and the communities that it affects, um, I kind of think of it in a sphere. And at the farthest out edge of the sphere is really our, our rural communities and those that have that um, lower population density, right? The hardest to solve. We can't incentivize private operators to go expand because there just isn't the business case. They can't return the profit to shareholders that's needed to, to offer services there. I think that in those far out circles, it's going to absolutely require public private partnership and probably a different mix of very unique technologies and maybe even layered technologies uh, in order to really solve this problem. So we're, you know, I wholeheartedly support uh, what, what Dave said and the benefit that that brings, that model can bring communities in terms of, um, you know, that model creates power locally. If you own the network, you own all of the power to force competition, which will drive costs down. And I think if you can get past, uh, you know, the initial investment of broadband, when you really begin to look at the revenue models um, from municipal owned broadband, it pays the community back tenfold. And that's a fairly easy ROI to demonstrate over a fairly short amount of time when it, when you're looking through an infrastructure lens anyhow. Um, so I think uh, I just wanted to, to say that because you got me excited um, about open access and municipal owned infrastructure. So um, so on the merit end, we, uh, we did have a pretty uh, good public private partnership. Um, it was kind of uh, a, a fallout of, of the pandemic. Um, and uh, so shortly after COVID, uh, you know, kind of took place. Merit um, had been engaging with uh, a, a lot of different entities around the digital divide. And so we had this concept that we, we called uh, the Community Access Network, which involved a partnership from Cisco Toyota Foundation and a number of different Merit connected community uh, anchor organizations within Flint, Washington, and Detroit. And this is of course like a kind of a short term pandemic play in terms of the technology we deployed. But at that time, this was, you know, last April, March that we began conversations. Everybody was really just kind of chaotically running around trying to figure out how we can get any level of access to these communities so that kids could learn, people could work, et cetera. And so we were able to pull together um, a really good partnership with a mix of uh, Toyota Foundation funding, Cisco uh, provided equipment and turnkey installations, Merit community members, of course, offered site access for us to deploy um, uh, wireless technology. And we were basically bleeding their Merit connectivity to the edge of the property. Um, and we selected properties, obviously, that had big parking spaces so that the community could have drive up access and some form of access. So we were proud of, of that project. We were able to deploy at over 50 sites across um, Washington County, Detroit and Flint. And, um, you know, and looking at would we expand that type of model, I think ultimately we really want to keep our eye on the long term and a lot of the, the future proof um, capacity type technologies, but uh, in the short term we're able to act quickly and kind of deploy technologies to get communities the solutions they need and, and we made that happen with that community access project. Um, I think in the longer term scenario, what we're really trying to build is this entire statewide ecosystem. So we've developed this this uh, platform called the Moonshot Marketplace. And that's really where we put service providers that offer services for plan, build, run, operate and maintain. And it's agnostic of the model. So it can support a, you know, a municipal owned network with a private pri provider operating and maintaining. We run into a lot of communities that don't necessarily wanna operate and own infrastructure. 
um, but they or, or sorry, they don't want to operate it, but they they want to own it. Um, so we can bring in private providers to kind of serve that function and uh, deal with you know consumer um, knock issues and things like that. Um, and then, of course, there's kind of the all out model, which utilities can deploy pretty easily, which is that it's owned, operated and maintained by the utility. And of course, that probably keeps the most control within the community of all the models. I like it. That's cool. Well, I mean, that's kind of a good segue into Jeff. Um, so, Jeff, you're a utility. I mean, what opportunities do you see for ITC and other private companies to partner with communities to extend broadband access? Yeah, so it's interesting. I, you know, during the pandemic, um, I, we got a, a second place up on a lake and we're hanging out there with the family. The kids, of course, were doing remote school and uh, we had horrible internet service up there. So I felt the problem. I mean, I, you know, and I'm trying to do uh, video conference calls and everything. And it just so happened, I got a phone call um, asking me to look into um, how can ITC get involved in, in helping out with this problem. I'm like, man, that's great. You know, I, I want to go solve this problem. So, um, you know, and of course, I mentioned earlier, we've got 16,000 circuit miles of, of, of fiber up in the air. It's a closed loop. The first place I went to was our, our regulatory group. Uh, because we only do transmission, uh, we are regulated uh, by FERC, and um, you know we looked into that. And one of the first things I, I you know was told is, look, if if we had this as a business model, um, it would be great. Any profits would go into a credit against the rate. I'm an economic developer at heart, along with the the rest of the group on this uh, on this call and this conference. Uh, so I was excited about that. I'm like, okay, that's great. So now I'm solving two problems. So I'm really excited about it. Uh, then I um, went to our real estate group. I'm sorry, my dog is the worst possible timing is barking in the background <laughs> to the new age. So excuse the barks if you can. Uh, but uh, I, I went then to our real estate department because we have these uh, right away real estate uh, agreements. Now in Michigan, we've got about 8,000 circuit miles, almost half of our circuit miles are in Michigan. We got those through acquisitions. We acquired Detroit Edison's transmission assets and we acquired Consumer Energy's transmission assets. So with that acquisition came a lot of legacy um, real estate uh, deals in terms of right away. Um, our real estate rights are only for transmission. Anything outside of transmission, uh, for, for instance, joint use uh, for things like um, people attaching uh, cellular communications or anything else, um, those, those dollars go to um, consumers or Detroit Edison as part of the deal, except for where we had uh, projects where we built things uh, brand new from the ground up, which we have some of that in Michigan. But I thought, well, you know, that's okay. I think we could probably go to those utilities. We could probably unwind those. And, you know, I'm in the process of, of working through that. Um, then, but then the biggest hurdle I think I've run into is the security issue. And I think we've all read the headlines about the Colonial Pipeline recently, where they shut down half of the uh, U.S. East Coast uh, U.S. fuel supply uh, on a cyber attack, right? So those are things that we're worried about in our space. Um, and, and right now it is a closed loop. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, I talked to a lot of internet service providers. I talked to you know people. I, I learned about you know we've got um, advantages with long haul uh, routes. We've got routes through cities. Um, they're 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 great routes. Uh, but but right now um, I'm kind of being held up between uh, the the real estate uh, hurdles and our security hurdles. So so where we're at today is right now we're looking at partnering with our utility partners that where we have, uh, you know, where we shake hands with municipalities like Holland or Detroit Edison, or uh, there are several electric cooperatives as well in the, state of the in the state of Michigan. And right now, really more for utility purposes, uh, we feel uh, comfortable with that. And I'm, I'm working towards it, but right now we're not in a place, unfortunately, where we can share with the masses, but uh, we'll see what happens. I'm gonna keep pushing. Well, I love it. And thank you for sharing that inside baseball that you're working on it and, and willing to look into it further and that you felt it firsthand. And, and please don't stop with um, you know some of us going back to work because we just need it so bad. And, it, and it's really about inequalities that exist um, between our communities that have it and those who don't. 
And so Charlotte, you know, what does it really mean for, for citizens and employers um, when those inequalities do exist? Yeah, I, we call this the haves and the have nots. And I think individually, it's it's easy to understand, you know, what a disadvantage that the lack of affordable access means to an individual household or family on a community scale, um, you know, I would just offer that it's it's just magnified and, and exacerbated uh, exceptionally. I mean, lack of affordable access limits, as, as Jennifer mentioned when she opens, people's ability uh, to access jobs, government services, healthcare, education. Um, we did a study back in 2018, 2019 school year with the Michigan State University Quello Center, and that was actually the pilot that eventually led to our data collection services that we uh, offer to counties today. And in that study, um, we were ab able to isolate the impact of broadband on K-12 students without access to broadband services in the home. And we found that um, students without access in the home are less likely to attend college. They have lower grade point averages. They have lower standardized test scores. Um, they are less likely to choose a STEM or STEAM career path. And students without uh, access in the home um, at all are, are actually worse off than students with cell phone only access. So that's a formally published uh, research study by Quello Center, and that's available out there at broadbandgap.net. And I think it does a really good job of, of demonstrating that everything that I mentioned there in terms of the, the student um, the negative impacts are really uh, life outcome impacts when you really think about the scope of, of what that what that means over the student's lifetime. And so um, we're proud of that report, and I think it does a great job um, talking about how our youth, you know, um, and, and that affecting them at that age in their life uh, and, and how that can follow them throughout life. Now, that's really important, and I, I think there's so much at risk if we don't fix the digital divide, but I'm going to ask Dave, um, and I, I know all of you have thoughts, but we're running out of time. Dave, um, what is at risk if we don't, if we don't get this fixed? You know, I mean, Charlotte touched on a, a number of those um, disparities and the impacts. And I think ultimately, you know, we look at what broadband is and it's an enabling system. It, it, it's, it's a system that once you have it in place, you know, it provides opportunities for things that weren't there before. You know, we know this in terms of access to information and education. We know this in terms of social connections, you know, um, what we've done all this past year in terms of these video uh, connections and so much more there, healthcare, you know, the economic development opportunities associated with it. But I think just like, again, going back to electricity in the early 1900s, you know, lighting streets at the time and now what we use it for in terms of everything electrification in our house, in our vehicles, you know, moving in, in the direction where we couldn't conceive of the uses back then and I think the same applies here for broadband is that there's this world of opportunity that is untapped because the fact that we don't have the enabling force fully deployed throughout the entire communities yet um, and I think without that being done the communities will never really uh, achieve their full potential um, and I think that it also what plays a part is all these things that Charlotte talked about in terms of these inequities um, cost, there's a cost to that. There's a societal cost to that in order to deal with the outcomes of those issues. And, and then on the other end, in terms of not having that opportunity or enabling force, there's a lost opportunity cost as well. So whether it's the things we haven't been able to obtain because of that lost opportunity or the things we have to spend as communities today to deal with those inequities, that's the reality that we're in until we bridge this digital divide. And I, what I was really encouraged about in Holland is that on our journey here to explore this community level investment, we did some recent polling um, and just to gauge how people are using the internet, but also their willingness to look at this as a public good really, you know, beyond uh, what it has been to date and really kind of seeing this as a core utility infrastructure like water, like sewer, like electricity is. Do they envision it that way? And if they do, do they believe a community level investment's needed? There was a strong positive reaction here in Holland that a community level really is needed. And when we asked them why they would be willing to support something like that, 
we gave them a number of different choices as to why that is, you know, lowering my bill, things like that. Those were all really um, high rated, but the highest rating was 75% of the people that responded to that said that they would support a community level investment to ensure that all in the community have access, which I think is a very positive thing that people see this as being a necessary future thing for a community survival and for it to thrive. And so I think the fact that you know people are understanding that is really um, heartening and is, is gonna help us move forward to ensure that we can eliminate the divide you know, that does exist. So I'm, 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 I'm pretty bullish on that here based upon some of the information that we've gotten back. Well, and thank you. And thank you, uh, all three of our panelists. We're gonna need all three you continuing to push hard and also to be mentors to other local units of government, other business leaders who wanna advocate so we will make sure that um, those on the webinar have access to your contact information because I know you're willing to do that. And I think today we really learned broadband is a utility like clean water, um, big economic development benefits for broadband. And there's also big risks if we don't figure out a way to solve this issue. And it's there's really no silver bullet but as Charlotte said, is the first step is understanding that we have an issue and continuing this conversation. And I'm so happy that our local units of government, um, our local leaders have really um, set all across the board that this is a high priority um, for their funding, uh, for federal funding spend or future millage or opportunities. Um, so stay tuned, Ottawa County um, does have a rollout plan um, for their partnership with Merit Network, and we'll be doing a resident survey shortly. And so we will make sure that you're up to date on that. Um, there is also um, websites up on your screen right now um, that have information on Ottawa County's digital inclusion um, study. Allegan County um, also is looking at broadband as a priority, and they have a great website as well that we'll make sure that's up on your screen that you can check out Allegan County's progress as does Holland BPW. So all of them are hard at work on determining solutions. It's a continuing conversation and we'll make sure you keep you up to date on the planning process, but please check those websites for information. Um, and broadband access really is key to growing our employment base and Lakeshore Advantage supports primary businesses from startup to grown up or thriving area employers. And so we wanna invite all of you today to join us in person for our Startup Stage Business Success Celebration on June 17th. And this is our first in-person outdoor event that will be celebrating five years of a thriving entrepreneurial ecosystem. And let me tell you, if we don't have access to broadband, we cannot have our ecosystem continue to thrive. And so in the follow-up email, you each receive a discount for 50% off your tickets to the surge celebration great food but great fun that will be had there you just can't miss it and you'll get a chance to meet with some of our entrepreneurs as well um, so thank you to our panelists thank you to our attendees for being here today let's keep working together to move our region forward have a great afternoon